Hey everyone, and welcome to my first video of 2024. It's been over two years since I made a video about a challenge run, but with the remake of Persona 3 being just around the corner, I thought this was the perfect opportunity for me to return to this game. Now, you've already seen the video's title, and you might be asking, what does this mean? Well, for those of you unaware, Persona 3 marked the start of modern Persona, and introduced a number of new mechanics, the biggest one being the calendar system. Basically, you get a number of days in between major story events, and you can use time you have during those for dungeon crawling and other activities. You can do part-time jobs, hang out with friends, and the bonds you form will have in-game benefits. I made this challenge to answer the question, what happens if you disregard the calendar system? No social links, no part-time jobs, just the most mundane, bare-bones life of a Japanese high school student, but the rest of the game played out like normal, just like in mainline SMT or classic Persona. Of course, a run like this needs a fitting protagonist, and I decided to go with the main character of Death Note, Light Yagami. If you need a refresher, Light is a high school student who always gets the best grades in class, while dealing with the supernatural in his spare time. Any quote-unquote distraction would negatively affect his health and mental performance, so he pretty much does the work for us when laying down the rules. The first rule is that the only social links I'm allowed to have are the automatic ones. I cannot start or rank any of them up manually. The second is that I will spend most of my time studying, but I can also improve my charm and courage through eating and drinking coffee, since they don't affect the game outside of social link requirements. That's it however, no part-time jobs, no arcade, no karaoke. I also cannot go to the nurse's office or doze off during class. If my character gets tired, I'll have to deal with it in some other way. Lastly, I will play on Maniac Mode and beat all of the game's bosses. You may have noticed that the rules don't say anything about going on dates with Elizabeth or doing other side quests. Since these missions don't consume any in-game time, and some are even required to unlock a certain boss, I'll be allowed to do them. So, ready? We start a new game on Maniac difficulty and choose the male protagonist. In this timeline, Light's parents died in an accident 10 years ago, and he's now transferring back to the city where said accident happened. He walks to his new place at a dorm, but notices that a strange phenomenon is occurring on the streets. Although this is not the first time it happened. Once he arrives, he meets a boy named Pharos, and he has a contract to sign. Our first couple of days here are part of the prologue when the calendar system hasn't started yet, so technically they have nothing to do with this challenge. We get introduced to Mitsuru, Yukari, Junpei, and the rest of the school, Chairman Akutsuki, as well as Igor and Elizabeth. Eventually we get confronted by a shadow during the dark hour, but this isn't just a regular shadow. This is the first full moon shadow, the magician, and he knocks Yukari out before she has a chance to do anything. So we step in, and awaken to our first persona, Orpheus. The first encounter is nothing special. We start with the bash skill and finish off the shadow in a clean hit. We then pass out and meet Igor again who explains the nature of our power. Basically, due to us being the wild card, we can use personas of all arcanas. Later that month, we are introduced to Seas, an organization dedicated to hunt shadows during the dark hour. Due to our special power, they offer us a place in the team. A chance to become a righteous hero who protects the innocent from shadows? So we agree, and this starts our first automatic social link, the Fool. The next night, Junpei also joins, and Akahiko takes us to a special place for training. Down to the right here is the fun part of town. This is our first time entering Tartarus, and we also have a new skill called Agi which we can use to knock down the enemies and do an all-out attack. This is also where we are introduced to Shuffle Time, which we can use to get money, experience boosts and new personas. We get Pixie from the first and Asparas from the second, boosting our number of personas to three. The next day we head to the weapon store with Akahiko, and this is where the prologue ends and our challenge officially begins. After checking if everyone is in good condition, we head back to Tartarus and start grinding. The chance of a shuffle time increases if Light deals the final blow, and is guaranteed if you finish off the enemies with an all-out attack. I'll mostly aim for the wand cards to get as much experience as possible. 
We don't have to climb the tower for long before reaching the first guardian, the Venus Eagles. They use wind which is Junpei's weakness and are weak to pierce. The optimal strategy here is to guard with Junpei and use Yukari's bow to knock all three of them down and do an all-out attack. The fight goes pretty smoothly until one of them gets a lucky critical on Yukari, which leads to them bringing the whole party down to low health. Still, we manage to hold on due to them targeting Yukari with wind attacks, despite her resisting it. Sadly, Junpei still goes down, but we manage to finish off the remaining eagle. We then use our only revival bead and move on to the next guardian, the Dancing Hands. They are weak to strike attacks, which makes Light our main attacker this time. The problem is that they seem to use all elemental attacks to knock us down, and Tentarafu to prevent us from using our personas. Luckily, we manage to keep our health up, and thanks to a lucky dodge from Junpei, as well as a lucky critical, we claim our victory with relative ease. That was a close one! After fusing Nekomata in the Velvet Room, we decide to do a little more grinding. We get Asparas back through Shuffle Time, and then fuse her with Nekomata to get out, our first persona with Sukunda. The next day, our classmate Kenji drags us to the restaurant to get some ramen. This automatically starts the Magician Social Link, but we won't rank it up any further. Mitsuru warns us about the fatigue caused by exploring Tartarus, so we go to bed early to regain our strength. Next day we go to the toilet in order to get rid of the mud in our system. We spend the rest of the day studying in the library and head back to Tartarus. The third guardian is the Assault Drive, which uses Strike, Lightning, which Yukari is weak to, resists fire, and is immune to physical. I use Sukunda on the first turn to lower his accuracy. So naturally he immediately scores a critical on Yukari. I use a revival bead to pick her back up and start using wind attacks. Things go relatively well until Amazio shocks Light and he gets knocked out by the follow-up. On the next attempt, I stick to spamming Garu with both Light and Yukari while Junpei is on healing duty and the fight goes much better. The boss doesn't get any criticals and Yukari manages to dodge most of the lightning strikes. Towards the end, Light uses his first fusion spell, Cadenza, which not only restores HP, but also raises our agility. Fusion spells are a little different in Portable. Unlike in the PS2 version, they are tied to special items that give you a certain number of casts. The upside is that you don't need the specific personas to use them, which will be essential later on. Yukari still goes down to Amazio, but we immediately use a revival bead and end the battle. You have the potential to grow even stronger. With that out of the way, we grab the first old document and do some more fusions. Not long after, Mitsuru asks us to join the student council. This would start the emperor's social link, but since it's optional, we obviously won't do that. A few days of studying later, we get a call from Elizabeth that the special requests are now available. She and Light also start dating. And while it is far less interesting than in the PS2 version due to a lack of visuals, it still takes top priority. I won't go into detail about the rest of the requests, I completed what I could. We also start watching Tanaka's show, which airs on Sunday mornings, and sometimes they sell some rather useful items. During the next full moon, we learn that some shadows hijacked a monorail, so that's where we head next. For the most part, the full moon operations have many levels with some rather weak enemies. Since we're trying to stop them from ramming into another train, this puts us on a timer, but that's barely a problem. We reach the front car in no time, where we come face to face with the second full moon shadow, the High Priestess. And she's a complete joke. All she has is a single target panic move, Bufu which none of us are weak to, and two summons that are weak to ice. After a few turns of bombarding her with magic, she goes down. The next morning, Elizabeth informs us that the second block of Tartarus is now open. 
We also get access to the compendium, allowing us to re-summon previous personas. Since midterms are coming up, we focus on raising our academics as high as possible. Iori is unconscious. Come on, hang in there. This is light we're talking about, so he has to get the highest score at all times. And not only do we score the highest, but Mitsuru also gives us a set of cards as a reward. Akihiko finally joins the party after midterms, and while Junpei is currently unavailable, that doesn't stop us from grinding in the new block. Here's a fun bit of trivia. If you don't join a sports club until the 27th of May, your teacher will force you into one. We don't have to regularly attend though, so we join the swimming team, get the first rank of the chariot social link, and head back to the dorm. With a full party we can finally make real progress. We also fuse a Jack Frost with Dia, completing the first fusion request. The first guardians of block 2 are the crying tables. They use fire, poison, and are weak to ice. I start by knocking them down and doing an all-out attack like usual, only to realize that I underestimated their damage output, as they obliterate the party with Miragi. So I change tactics, instead of all-out attacks, I opt to make them dizzy to lift some of the pressure, while buffing Light's defense with Rakukaja. Halfway through the fight, they start using poison, but that's much easier to deal with. We take them out one at a time, and claim our victory. Not bad, huh? A few days later, we hear some rather disturbing rumors. Apparently, a girl from our school went missing, and some of the students believe she turned into a vengeful ghost. It is our task to investigate. However, we still have some work to do inside Tartarus. The next guardian is the Change Relic, which takes Light out with a Magarula. On the second attempt, I mostly rely on Alp due to her wind resistance, and it actually works. The Relic keeps targeting the party members that resist her attacks, and on the rare occasion she does go for the right target, it misses. Junpei still goes down twice due to Magarula, but I can easily revive him and use Cadenza to heal the party. After a lot of attacking and a lucky critical, we beat the relic, and get the second document for Elizabeth. We finally get some information thanks to a delinquent named Shinjiro Aragaki, and deduce that the girl we're looking for is now stuck inside Tartarus. In order to enter the right place at midnight, we infiltrate the school, but get temporarily separated. After a bit of sneaking around, we find Fuka Yamagishi. On our way down, however, we run into the full moon shadows, the Empress and the Emperor. The Empress is weak to all physical and the Emperor is weak to all elemental. Using this knowledge, we can knock both of them down and do an all-out attack with each party member. We bring them down to half health in a single turn, but then the Emperor takes light out with a swift strike. You know what the worst part is? There is no checkpoint during full moon operations, so I had to do the whole infiltration bit again. On the second attempt, I start with lowering the Emperor's attack while raising Light's defenses. I then focus on getting rid of him as quickly as possible. Halfway through the fight, both of them change their resistances with Paradigm Shift. The idea is to scan them with Fuka's persona for weaknesses, but for whatever reason, the Empress doesn't change her resistances a single time. After the Emperor goes down, I let Junpei get K out so the remaining boss won't be able to take advantage of his wind weakness. A few all-out attacks later, we complete the mission. The enemy's I've weakness. been waiting for this! Okay, now! That was amazing! Fuka becomes our new navigator a few days later, meaning that Mitsuru officially joins the front line. We start the automatic death social link with Pharos, go on our second date with Elizabeth, and head back to Tartarus to clear out the second half of Block 2. Before facing the Guardians, I decided to fuse some new personas. Our next fight is against the Golden Beetles. They use physical, are weak to lightning, and they hit like a truck. Seriously, only Mitsuru went down during my successful attempt, but I got very lucky that they didn't use their stronger moves on anyone else. Also, the lack of multi-target skills starts showing its ugly head, as missing even a single Zeo would have been disastrous. Although they were barely holding on to life after three all-out attacks, I didn't risk a fourth one, 
and instead finished them all off with a Miragi. The battle's over. Good job, everyone! A few days later, Elizabeth informs us that some people went missing. I haven't mentioned it yet, but sometimes civilians wander into Tartarus, and you get a reward for rescuing them before the next full moon. The final guardian of Block 2 is the Intrepid Knight, and this fight wasn't hard at all, but it was extremely humiliating. All the knight does is use Mind Charge, Wind Skills, and Hama Skills. The reason it was humiliating is because I set up a magic mirror while forgetting that he drains wind. So the repel effect healed him, making the fight twice as long as it should have been, all while wasting a valuable item. The only saving grace here was Oberon with his media. Not much else to say, just keep lowering his attack and accuracy, and go full elemental. The shadows are getting stronger as well. We grab the third document, rescue the missing people, and collect our reward from the police. We also manage to buy some dodge element accessories in order to mitigate our party's weaknesses. The full moon arrives, and we find the next boss, the Hierophant, in a love hotel. This time, Yukari insisted on tagging along, but I would have chosen her over Mitsuru anyway for a few reasons. The Hierophant uses Meizanga which she's weak to. But if you keep guarding with her, it keeps her protected from the Prophecy of Ruin, which scares the whole party, and if you don't cure it on the next turn, the boss uses Swift Strike for a guaranteed critical on everyone. I play this fight very safe, keeping Oberon equipped for his lightning immunity, using Tarunda with Akahiko, and Rakukaja with Junpei, hoping that the Hierophant will waste a turn getting rid of the buff. The only hole in our defense is when Yukari has to use a Mi Patra gem to get rid of the fear, since it opens her up for an attack. There is a turn where she gets struck by lightning, but it also shocks her, which ironically protects her from the fear effect, and there is also a turn at the end of the battle where almost everyone gets paralyzed, but Akahiko manages to cure the fear at the last moment, and he also lands the killing blow on the next turn. <laughs> However, there is another shadow lurking in the hotel, who gets the jump on the whole party, and hypnotizes Light to get down and dirty with Yukari. Not wanting to cheat on Elizabeth, we shake off the mind control and explain the situation to her. <gasps> she took it a lot better than I expected. We regroup with Junpei and Akahiko, only to find out we're locked out of the boss room. In order to crack it open, we need to smash the mirrors that don't show our reflection. Once it's done, we finally confront the sixth full moon shadow, the lover. This fight is a breeze. The boss only has single target ailment moves which are easy to cure, uses fire which none of us are weak to, and is vulnerable to shock. After light manages to shock it, we land three criticals, each followed by an all-out attack. Then we just finish it off with regular attacks. <laughs> Despite landing the killing blow, Junpei gets mad all of a sudden that we're taking the credit. Dude, I'm not the one charging headfirst into danger. That's why I'm leading the team. In the meantime though, Fuka and Yukari did some digging. They confront Mitsuru with the information they found, and we finally learn that Tartarus and the Dark Hour are the result of the Kirijo group's experiments. More importantly, however, they are directly linked to the full moon shadows, and if we beat all of them, the world will return to normal. A few days later, Pharos brings up the idea that whatever happened here might have something to do with the accident that took Light's parents. We ace our exams once again, and the chairman introduces another potential member for the squad, Kanamata. Honestly, he's too young for this in my opinion. Before heading to Yakushima, I decided to start the third block of Tartarus. The first guardians are the furious Gigas. They only use physical attacks, but they can also charge up, causing them to hit way over our max HP. This fight is basically a race against the clock, we knock them down with wind, do an all-out attack, and repeat while hoping they run out of HP before they target light. Both Mitsuru and Yukari get K out once during my successful attempt, but that doesn't stop us from finishing them off. Oh, 
one. I've Attack. been waiting for this. Okay, now! The next guardian is the Fanatic Tower. It uses Meizanga, so I make Yukari guard to cover her weakness. However, it also has Mind Charge, which causes both Yukari and Mitsuru to get KO'd very early on. And Light only survives because he has Oberon equipped. Afterwards the fight devolves into Light and Akahiko hitting the tower with whatever they have, while I'm switching back and forth between Oberon and Pale Rider. At the very end of the fight it uses Elect Break. Any earlier, and I would have lost, but not when it's one hit away from dying, and Akahiko delivers the final blow. Let's go! We did it. The trip to Yakushima is one we won't soon forget. It starts out pretty normal with a day on a beach. Have you ever run across a sex bot? That night, we see a recording of Yukari's father, who says that he sabotaged the Kirijo group's experiment and caused a disaster. But if he hadn't, the entire world would have paid the price. This somehow makes Yukari think her dad is at fault here, but I don't get it. Specifically, what would have happened if the experiment succeeded? This recording gave us more questions than answers. The next day, Junpei and Akahiko forces Light to help them pick up girls on the beach so he drives them away as quickly as possible. Just as the boys are about to give up however, something unexpected happens. We come across a sex bot. Her name is Igis, and Akutsuki explains that a decade ago, she was given some practical adjustments. Like anti-shadow combat features. My god, imagine the possibilities! It didn't happen to come with an owner's manual, did it? Ah, forget it. Trial and error should do it. After returning from Yakushima, we find out that Light once again had the highest exam scores, before heading back to Tartarus to complete a few more requests for Elizabeth. We also have a few days of mandatory training for a swimming competition, where we get bested by a kid named Mamoru, who would be the star social link. The next full moon shadow is hiding in a bunker, but as we head inside, we're confronted by Straga, a group of assassins who want to preserve the dark hour but all they do is lock us in. Seriously, did these guys really think we don't have backup? All they did was offer us the shadow on a silver platter. Or shadows, because we once again have two bosses. The Justice and the Chariot are both hiding in a tank, and can switch back and forth between a single health bar and two units. They have ailment moves, multi-hitting physical attacks, but the one thing to keep in mind is to kill both of them on the same turn. Otherwise, one will revive the other with Sama Recarm. The best bet is to bring them down to low health, wait for them to unite, deplete the one health bar, and finish them once they separate. Let's go! Not long after, Pharos warns us that Strega are not our only enemies, and there's a traitor among us. He doesn't know who, but the message is clear. If we trust our allies too much, someone will eventually stab us in the back. A dog named Koromaru also joins the squad. After another date with Elizabeth, I head back to Tartarus to finish the third block. The next guardian isn't even worth mentioning, but the last one, the natural dancer, is a major problem. It has sexy dance which has a high chance of charming the whole party, and it messes up our strategy. Before attempting the fight again, I buy a Null Charm skill card in the antique shop, and give it to power. Afterwards it's all a matter of countering the Magarudine attack, which Light and Yukari are relatively safe from due to their wind resistance, and can take a hit to get rid of the occasional Tetracarn. Mitsuru still goes down a few times, but we have so many revival beads at this point, that it's only a minor annoyance. After 10 minutes of attacking, we win the battle and grab the fifth document at the top of block 3. The next few weeks are relatively uneventful, we complete a few more requests, fuse more personas, raise our social stats, and buy fusion spells from the antique shop in Tanaka's show. By the end of August, Ken and Shinjiro officially join the front line. During the next full moon, Junpei suddenly vanishes from the dorm, but we'll worry about him later. The boss this time is the Hermit, 
who for some reason only uses electric moves, putting life in Akahiko at a major advantage. It also has a unique move called Giga Spark, but it takes three turns just to charge it up, giving everyone ample time to defend. Not much to say here, no one went down, no surprises, this boss is too easy, but I have a feeling that I'm going to eat those words. We return to the dorm, only to run into the third member of Strega who kidnapped Junpei. After overpowering and capturing her, we figure out that he tried to impress this girl by posing as our leader. I would punch him in the face for giving our identities away to a random stranger, but he essentially took a bullet for me, and we have a valuable prisoner now. The interrogation doesn't give us any useful information, but a few days later Shinjiro brings a special medication called suppressants. Unlike us, the members of Strega haven't awakened to their powers naturally, so they have to take these regularly to stop their personas from killing them. Although, if Shinjiro knows where to get the pills, then he must be taking them as well. Akahiko realizes this and decides to confront him about it. I'm tired of your damn preaching. Yeah, <sighs> Ow! What the fuck are you doing? My brother died at the Battle of Hoover Dam. You're desecrating a war memorial. That same night, we start scaling the fourth block of Tartarus. The first guardians in our way are the arcane turrets. They use fire, mind charge, distress, and are weak to ice. I took a huge risk by giving both Light and Mitsuru a fire weakness, but we have to get rid of the turrets as quickly as possible. The only Agi Dine that gets out hits Akahiko, but I quickly help him back up, and after the fourth all-out attack, we claim our victory. The enemy's down. Let's finish. You'll fall by my hand. <laughs> Before facing the next guardian, I decide to call it a day and stock up on supplies. Going up against the sleeping table, I knew exactly what I was getting into. This guardian can use Muragi Dine and Meji Dola with really high damage. I fused Ketsakawaddle prior to this fight specifically for his Ma Rakukaja ability, while Akahiko is ready to debuff the attack with Tarunda. After the first Muragi Dine, however, something unexpected happens. Light lands a critical, which is followed by an all-out attack. Alright, let's kick some ass. Let's do it. Then a second one. Alright, let's kick some ass. Let's do it. Then a third one. Here's our chance. Let's do it! We grab the sixth document and call it a day. A few days later we get hit by a typhoon and spend the whole weekend in a coma. During this we are summoned into the Velvet Room, where Igor tells us that the multi-persona fusions are now available. Before the next full moon, I fused a couple more personas. Mo in particular will be very important due to his ghastly whale ability. We already have all of our social stats maxed out, but we'll keep studying nonetheless. The next full moon comes, but this time, both Ken and Shinjiro are absent for whatever reason. No time to look for them, so we just assemble the party and march against the full moon shadows, fortune and strength. For this fight, we'll be focusing on defense. The strength shadow uses physical attacks, while the fortune uses wind, and a special move called Wheel of Fortune. This can do a number of things, but as long as it lands on blue, it only benefits our party, and it always lands on whatever on the opposite side is when you press the button. I stall it out until the ailment wheel appears. I use it to inflict fear on the strength shadow, and proceed to insta-kill it with Mo's ghastly wail. I do the same to the fortune a few turns later, ending the fight.
It seems like our work is done, until Akahiko remembers that the day is October 4th, and Mitsuru lets us in on a grim secret. Two years ago, the squad was protecting a woman and her son from a shadow, but Shinjiro's persona went berserk at the worst possible moment and killed the woman. Ken was the boy who survived, and as you may have already guessed, he plans on taking revenge for it. However, this is when Takaya, the leader of Strega, interferes. The reason he's here is because he wants to know who our navigator is. Instead of putting Fuka in danger, Ken chooses to sacrifice himself by claiming that he is the navigator. Rest peacefully. Mom. <laughs> Shinjiro takes the second bullet, and the wound is fatal. We arrive a few seconds too late. There's nothing we can do now. This is how it should be. <coughs> the next morning, we attend his funeral. Say something, will ya? Why are you always like that? You're so stubborn. Put yourself in my shoes for a change. You think it's the other way around, huh? I guess you're right. I was too obsessed with power. Ever since I lost Miki, that's all I've cared about. I thought that if I was strong enough, I could protect anyone. But I was wrong. And now you're gone too. I'm such an idiot. In battle, there's always a chance of dying. I knew that. But I was so focused on fighting that I didn't notice anything else. It didn't matter how tough I was. Look what happened! <laughs> yeah, I know. Crying won't change anything, will it? This is when our party members start their second awakenings. Their personas gain stronger resistances, endure, and a new set of skills. The first one is Akihiko. That night, we gather in the dorm to pass judgment on Ken. However, he didn't wait for us to decide his fate, and ran away. Then he returns the next day, as expected. I considered the possibility that maybe he was the traitor Feros was talking about, but he did prove his loyalty to us and the rest of the squad agreed with me on that. But if it isn't Ken, and it isn't Junpei, then who is it? I decided to get the rest of Block 4 out of the way as quickly as possible. The next opponents are the Hell Knights, and I have a special surprise for them. Dreamfest is a fusion spell that's almost guaranteed to charm all enemies, an ailment this Guardian isn't immune to. While they are busy attacking each other, we take out the first one, and the second one follows shortly after. Thanks to our Ma Raku Kaja, their attacks don't do much, and after a lucky critical, we finish off the last one with an all-out attack. The last one is the mythical Gigas. It nulls fire and has high counter, so wind and electric are the way to go. For this fight, I give everyone a semi-support role. Light uses the buffs, Akahiko does the debuffing, while Ken and Yukari are on healing duty. There is one point where the Gigas gets two criticals and does a follow-up on Akahiko, which would KO him, but it doesn't thanks to Endure. We pick everyone back up quickly, and a few turns later, we claim our victory. I'll do my best until the very end. We make it to the top of Tartarus, but something isn't right. Not only is it strangely empty, but the pillars are arranged in a weird way, almost as if the tower is incomplete. Well, there is nothing we can do for now, so we just grab the document and leave. We ace our exams yet again, and our reward this time is the Queen card set along with the Bufudine skill card. Mitsuru's rewards are nothing I couldn't get from somewhere else, but they will save us some time we otherwise would spend grinding. Speaking of grinding, I got the two rare swords from the fourth block for Elizabeth, 
and the rewards are 15 Malachites and 3 Rubies. Anyone who played this game may have already guessed what I'm planning here. I also fuse Kikari He Me for her support skills, but also the Cool Breeze skill, which allows us to recover a bit of SP at the end of every battle. After rescuing more people from Tartarus, and delivering the Jack Frost dolls to unlock the next fusion request, we are ready for the last full moon shadow. As expected, Strega tries to get in our way. Jen uses Mudo, which would be intimidating if not for the fact that we still have a few homunculuses. Takaya uses heavy elemental attacks, but isn't smart enough to target our weaknesses, and even his revolver does insultingly low damage. This fight is infamous for how easy it is, and this is not the run that's going to change that. This can't be. They bail out, and it's finally time for the Hanged Man. In order to bring it down to the ground, we need to take out the three statues underneath it. One nulls fire, one nulls ice, and one nulls lightning. This is why I brought Igis and Yukari into this fight since they use physical and wind. Every time the boss falls, we can do an all-out attack, and the fight continues on the ground. It uses a number of physical skills, including Akasha Arts, which is the most dangerous. If it gets even a single critical, we lose. Towards the end, it starts summoning minions, who don't really put up a fight, but they can self-destruct, so be sure to take them out as quickly as possible. Only Igis goes down a single time, and we easily pick her back up. With patience and with plenty of luck, we claim our victory. The next day, we meet Pharos one last time, and max out the death social link. Everyone gathers in the dorm to celebrate, but it seems like Akutsuki and Igis are late to the party. We all count down for the first midnight since 10 years without the dark hour. However, something went wrong. This is when the penny drops. The traitor Pharos warned us about was Akutsuki. We finally learned what it was that Yukari's dad tried to interrupt. Yes, Tartarus and the Dark Hour were the result of the experiment, but that was back when things were going according to plan. What Professor Takeba actually interfered with was the final step, the fusion of the full moon shadows into a thirteenth shadow of the Death Arcana, one that is powerful enough to wipe out all life on the planet. Mitsuru's grandfather was trying to use this as a means to grant a new start for humanity. Akutsuki altered the final message, which originally meant to warn us not to kill the Twelve Shadows, because breaking them out of their shells allowed them to finally reunite. All because of some stupid prophecy about the orchestrator of the whole thing being the Prince of Death, who will become the King of the New World. I'll be honest though, Akutsuki's twist villainy is by far the weakest aspect of this game. His mannerisms indicated that there was something fishy going on here, but after the reveal, he just gloats a bit about how much of a chosen one he is. Just drink it like booze! <laughs> what? I... I was so close. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't make it through without any casualties, as Mitsuru's dad got caught in the crossfire. At least we now know that there is a final opponent for us to beat. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Igor reaffirms this the next night, as Light has to take full responsibility for his actions, so we must see this through to the end. After another date with Elizabeth, the secret of Block 4 gets revealed, a fake top. The stairs leading upward were invisible, but now we can move on to the fifth block. It is also worth mentioning that while the first four blocks looked like they were man-made, the remaining ones have a very Lovecraftian vibe to them. Buckle up, because we have five guardians to beat. The first ones are the Judgment Swords. They are resistant to everything except wind, so mind-charged Garudine is the way to go. The strategy here is to have Light take them out one at a time while Akahiko applies debuffs, and Ken and Koromaru are mostly on healing duty. 
The first one falls, but then the remaining two wipe out most of the party with Maziodines, and Light only survives thanks to Endure. We manage to pick ourselves back up, and blow the second sword into oblivion, and after that, it's only a matter of time before the last one follows. The enemy is getting stronger too! Next up are the Stasis Giants. They are very similar to the swords, except they only use physical attacks and are neutral to ice. We could wait for Mitsuru to become available, but I have a better plan. Kikari Himi has Mind Charge, Mabufula, and I also bought a Resist Slash card for her from the Antique Shop. Light once again does all the damage, while everyone else is on support, and this strategy ends up working well. There is one point when both Igus and Yukari get KO'd due to a lucky critical and a blade of fury, but I request an oracle from Fuka, which revives both of them with full HP. A few turns later, the last of the three giants goes down, and we call it a day. I can sense your determination! Back in the real world, we get a new classmate named Ryoji Mochizuki, but that's not really important when we have more guardians to fight. Thankfully the difficult ones in block 5 were beaten, so I'll briefly mention the remaining three. The Phantom King can use Mahamaon and Megiddo, but as long as you keep your defense up, and have personas that null Hama, you'll be fine. Light also manages to get three criticals, making it go down even faster. The Royal Dancers are not immune to charm, so I blew all of my remaining dream fests on them. While they are busy attacking each other, Light manages to knock them down for an all-out attack, before finishing the fight with the Rush Command. The Reckoning Dice nulls all elements and can set up Tetra card, so I have either Igus or Yukari get rid of it while Light and Akahiko do a huge amount of damage with normal attacks. The Dice's only scary move is Megiddo Lawn, but even without our buffs and debuffs, it's not enough to KO anyone in the party. Without any issues, we claim our victory and grab the final old document. Next is the Kyoto Trip, and, you know what, we don't talk about the Kyoto Trip. A few days later we manage to locate Strega, but someone interferes. Chidori managed to escape, and hacked into Fuka's persona. Junpei runs ahead, and while I'm starting to get tired of his recklessness, we have no choice. That girl likely knows our navigator's identity, if we don't silence her now, then Shinjiro died for nothing. As a parting gift, Shidori gives Junpei her persona, making him the second member of the squad to perform a fusion. The full moon arrives, but instead of the next shadow, we find Ryoji on the bridge, alongside a heavily damaged Igus. This is when the truth is revealed. Ryoji is actually Feras, the kid who was with us since the beginning of the game. You see, Feras is a special shadow who is meant to be a vessel for the other twelve. When Yukari's father sabotaged the experiment, he too was set free. Igus was sent after him with the order to kill on sight, but he was too strong. In an act of desperation, she resorted to seal him inside a boy whose parents died as collateral in the battle. You guessed it, that boy was light. When he returned, Pharaoh started calling for the Twelve Shadows, causing them to re-emerge, and our squad did the rest of the work. The goal was to summon Nyx, the Goddess of Death, who will wipe out all life on Earth. To think that our life took such a drastic turn, and we got wrapped up in this whole Armageddon conspiracy, all because we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The only way for things to return to normal is to stop Nyx. However, Ryoji warns us that winning will be impossible. Well, that was horrifying. The only guy who knows Nyx takes one look at us, and says that there is no way we can win. We need to find a way to get our spirits up quickly. Light gets laid by Elizabeth the next day. A week later, the rest of the squad decides that it doesn't matter what Ryoji says. We will fight to win. The remaining days of the year are spent studying and completing a few more requests in Tartarus. By the 30th of December, Igus gets repaired, and with a newfound resolve, gets her second awakening. On New Year's Eve, Ryoji returns with an offer. If we agree to submit to Nyx and have our memories erased, then we can live the rest of our days in blissful ignorance, and she'll make our deaths as painless as possible. 
or we can just reject the offer and go with the original plan. I opt for the latter, since giving up now would mean that all of our previous efforts were for nothing. With that, we max out the full social link and start the judgment social link. Shortly after, Elizabeth informs us that her sister Margaret is waiting for us at the bottom of Tartarus, looking for a challenge. Nix will arrive on the 31st of January, and we have until then to make it to the top of Tartarus. The first guardians of Block 6 are the Noble Seekers. They have all elemental attacks, but aren't smart enough to target our weaknesses specifically. Akahiko gets a critical on one of them, and makes it dizzy with a follow-up. Light also gets a critical with Deathbound, which is followed by a duo attack with Yukari. I won't miss! I made up my mind. I won't lose! Against the Carnal Snakes, I used the same strategy as the Stasis Giants. Mind Charge followed by Ma Bufudine. The Snakes use fire which none of us are weak to, and can use both Dekaja and Dekunda. But more often than not, it wastes their turns. Their actually dangerous moves are Spirit Drain which can take nearly all of a character's SP, and Life Drain which deals a big amount of almighty damage. They also have Mudun, so I recommend bringing a few homunculuses. Nevertheless, we move forward. A Guardian I've been particularly afraid of is the World Balance. It has all target elemental attacks, and whenever it hits a weakness, it follows up with Spirit Drain. I used a magic mirror in an attempt to counter it, only to find out that this is one of those enemies that knows when you do this, and responds with Megiddo Lawn. The rest of the fight is over 10 minutes of me trying to keep my party alive, while the world balance just spams it. At the end, Akahiko manages to shock it, which is followed by a critical from both Yukari and Igis, and two all-out attacks. The fierce Cyclops are very vulnerable to one of my previous strategies. Mind Charge followed by Ma Bufudine. Their main damage type is Slash, which is nulled by my current persona, but what's actually hilarious here is that half the time, they tumble over with their normal attacks, making themselves less than useless. They go for lightning attacks a couple of times, but that doesn't do enough damage to make a difference, and before long, we win the fight. The final Tartarus Guardian is the Jotun of Grief, who drains everything except for Pierce. So I brought Ken, Igis, and Yukari into this fight. The Jotun keeps trying to inflict rage on the whole party, which I actually want for some party members, since everyone except for Light wields a Pierce weapon. Also, for whatever reason, it keeps targeting Igis with Primal Force, which she nulls. We even got a lucky critical at the end, so the fight went incredibly smoothly. Without any major resistance, we claim our victory. Fire! The enemy is still alive! I succeed in protecting everyone? Getting as far as we can go before the 31st maxes out the Judgment Social Link, making it our final rank for this entire run. The true endgame starts here. With a bit more grinding, we get the gems needed for a single cast of Armageddon. We then take the bloody button request from Elizabeth, lure the Reaper into a trap, and I'll just show you what happens. With this, we unlocked Monad, the optional block of Tartarus with the highest level enemies. Before Nyx makes her move, we still have time to prepare for the true final bosses of the game. I set things up so the Tartarus operations will continue for the next three weeks. Just watch me guys, I'll study with my right hand and make new plans with my left. The first step in our preparation is getting some skill cards from our personas. Since most of them are tied to arcanas I don't have social links for, I use the growth 3 skill cards I bought from the antique shop to get the necessary experience through grinding. 
I specifically aim for the Ice Boost from Jack Frost, the Ice Amp from Titania, and the Ma Bufudine from Trumpeter. The last is the one I need for the second to last fusion request, and afterwards our Loki is already high enough level to complete the final one, and unlock Masakado for his heart item. Oh right, I haven't talked about heart items, have I? Basically, certain personas give you a special piece of equipment after reaching a high enough level, and this is our next step. Masakado's hair raises our evasion against physical attacks. The Tome of the Void we get from Abaddon makes us immune to all ailments except poison, while Messiah is quite a special case. His heart item is dependent on a dice roll, so I have to constantly reload my save until I get the correct one. In my case that's the Armor of Light, which halves all elemental damage. Last but not least, some weakness coverage for my party members, and this is where I have to decide who will be in the final lineup, since half of the null weakness accessories require ultimate personas of certain social links. The Blazing Flame requires maxing the Magician, so that rules Mitsuru out. The Lightning Gloves need maxed Chariot, so Aegis and Yukari are out of the question as well. And so is Koromaru, since the Radiant Halo requires max justice. However, we can get the Frozen Stone from Gabriel, the Storm Ring from Jitayu, and the Ring of Darkness from Thanatos. This makes Akihiko, Ken, and Junpei our final party members. This is also the point where Light reached max level, which raises both his HP and SP to 999. With this, we can finally tackle the remaining challenges ahead of us. Margaret is waiting behind the Paradigm Door, and has a number of challenges prepared for us. These vision quests can be split into two categories. The first ones are rematches with the Full Moon Shadows. Keep in mind that these bosses are now scaled for endgame, have new skills, and you are only allowed to use party members you could also do the original fights with. For example, for the High Priestess we can only bring Junpei and Yukari. Second are the Attribute Trials where you face many bosses with predetermined stats, personas, items, and party members. Both categories of fights give you some pretty good rewards which will be essential later. The first fight is against the High Priestess. She can now cast Bufudine and Tentarafu, but her HP bar is still way too low. Beating this quest for the first time also gives you 10 casts of Best Friends, the Persona 3 equivalent of Heat Riser. The Emperor and the Empress barely even get a chance to do anything, the only new move I saw was Vorpal Blade. The Hierophant actually got easier, since Light is holding the Tome of the Void, making him immune to fear. For some reason, the Lover keeps targeting Light with Holy Arrows, despite his charm immunity. Thanks to Amrita and Marakukaja, there isn't much the tank can do to us. There is one point where it manages to KO Junpei with a critical, but we can easily revive him. This is also when I started to realize just how powerful Light's Vorpal Blade is. The Hermit is next, and this is the first vision quest that gave us major problems. It has Mind Charge, which wouldn't be a big deal, if it wasn't for his two other new moves, Mamudun and Megiddo Lawn. This turns what was arguably the easiest full moon boss into one of the hardest of the endgame fights. The first few casts wipe both Ken and Koromaru out of the battle, and leave Light and Akahiko in really bad shape. Most of the time is spent trying to keep Akahiko alive, so at least someone can heal Light while I'm chipping away the Hermit's health bar. We still win on our first try, but just barely. Thankfully, the fear combo still works on the strength and fortune shadows, and they don't really put up a fight. However, the Full Moon rematches have another mechanic I haven't mentioned yet. By fulfilling certain conditions during these fights, you get extra rewards. For example, you get 10 casts of Infinity, which I absolutely need, if you let one of your party members get KO'd by the damage wheel. In my case, that was Yukari. Then we just pick her back up and use Ghastly Whale, ending the battle. The Hanged Man is where the boss finally catches up with us in terms of stats. First off, the statues now have a lot of HP. It takes a power-charged Vorpal Blade for them to go down, and I haven't even mentioned the main body yet, which has a total of 18,000 HP, and it has the attack power you would expect. Whenever it goes for Akasha Arts, I left praying that none of my party members go down. There is a point where everyone gets K out except for Light, and I only managed to get them back up thanks to Fuka's Oracle. Also, bringing Yukari back was a mistake, 
since the statues love taking advantage of her electric weakness. Even when she's defending, they target her specifically to crack her guard open. Although at some point, I remember using Tetrakarn, which at least protects us from the Akasha arts. It's a battle of patience and endurance, but we managed to pull through. Also, remember how I said earlier that the minions can self-destruct? Well, if you let it happen during the rematch, your reward will be 10 casts of Armageddon, which is 8 more than we need, but I'm not gonna complain. Let's talk about the attribute trials a bit. First is the trial of strength. As the three enemies take damage, they rotate their physical affinities, which is signaled by a message saying that their atmosphere has changed. My suggestion is to test it with myriad arrows, and damage them with slash attacks until all three of them null pierce. This means that they are weak to strike, so use an Akasha Arts with Shinjiro to knock all three of them down, and finish them off with an all-out attack. Next is the Trial of Magic. The opponents use elemental attacks in Hama on, but they don't null the latter, so just spam Makarakarn until it bounces back at them. Third is the Trial of Resistance. The Red Guardian has a wind weakness, so be sure to use it to your advantage. As for the black and white ones, they use buffs, debuffs, and poison. Do not remove any of those, otherwise they will retaliate. Also, if you don't guard with anyone, the black and white guardians will fall over when using their normal attacks, allowing you to use an all-out attack. The trial of speed is extremely tricky. Your opponent can follow one of four patterns, each with their own attacks and weaknesses every turn. You have to win this fight as quickly as possible, otherwise you get wiped by an instant kill move. Last is the trial of luck, and this is by far the easiest. All you have to do is guard, until the dice throws a number at you. If it's 1, switch to Pyro Jack and use Mudun. If it's 2, use Hama on with Jack Frost. With all of the vision quests completed, we got quite a few new skill cards as rewards, including Absorb Strike, Absorb Pierce, Mind Charge, Arms Master, and Enduring Soul. The only thing left to do is challenge the super bosses. Elizabeth is first, and this fight is infamous for a reason. As you may have already guessed, you have to fight this boss solo, but that's not the only rule you need to follow. During the fight, Elizabeth follows a strict rotation of personas, always switching at the beginning of her turn, and getting two actions afterwards. Cert uses and drains fire. Jack Frost is the same with ice, Thor with lightning, and Ku Kalane with wind. Metatron uses Hama and Null's elemental. Same for Alice, but she uses Mudo. Nebiros resists everything, and uses various ailment moves. Last but not least is Masakado, who nulls everything and uses Armageddon. No, that last one was not a joke. The game may call it Megiddo Lawn, but it does almost 10,000 damage, is undodgeable, and since she always casts it twice per turn, Enduring Soul won't save you. The only way to last through it is to protect yourself with Infinity every 7th turn. If you don't have enough, Valhalla is a good substitute. Just be sure to heal with a Soma every time you use it. But this is where the fight becomes really difficult. If you null the element or Hama or Mudo skill she's about to use, or any form of physical attacks, she will retaliate with Armageddon. Same goes for attack mirrors or magic mirrors, so you strictly have to resist her attacks. Emphasis on resisting, because Elizabeth hits like a pain train. Her normal attack does over 800 damage if you don't resist it, and that's a huge problem considering that she attacks twice every turn. The setup I'm using for this fight is the following. For her elemental turns, I use Messiah and Michael, who resist all physical and elemental thanks to the skill cards I got from the antique shop. Messiah has Ice Boost, Ice Amp, Magic Skill Up, and Niflheim, all for raw damage, while Michael has Mind Charge and High Counter. When she switches to insta-kill personas, that's when Anubis comes in. He naturally resists both Hama and Mudo, which pretty much guarantees that I don't run out of homunculuses by the end. I also gave him resist physical skill cards, power charge, weapons master, and high counter. I unequipped the Tome of the Void to free up my accessory slot, and fused a Sake Matama with Null Fear, Null Panic, and gave her Null Charm, Null Poison, and resist physical. Still, there is one important item missing. The Divine Pillar removes your ability to dodge, but it also halves all damage you take. Problem is, 
There is no way for me to obtain it, since it requires maxing out the Emperor's social link. This means that Elizabeth is hitting twice as hard as she normally would, forcing me to constantly heal with beads. So instead of waiting for an opening, I decided to create one with the best friend's skill, raising my attack, defense, and evasion. I also equipped Masakado's hair, so I can at least dodge her physical attacks more often. There are many ways this fight can go wrong. If I forget to switch personas, I lose. If I get too reckless and then fail to dodge her attack afterward, I lose. Worst case scenario, if she gets even a single critical, I lose. Keep in mind that there are no shortcuts to this boss, so if I lose, I have to go all the way through the 9 floors of Monad for a single rematch. But that's not even the worst part. As you may have already guessed, you can't cast Armageddon unless she's already below 10,000 HP. Problem is, she has a total of 20,000, and when she falls below half health for the first time, she brings out Pixie and heals to full. It's not like I can draw out the fight by grinding for more resources, since she will start spamming Armageddon if it lasts for over 100 turns. Here is how I got around this issue. I used a calculator to keep track of how much damage I did so far, and once I got close to the threshold, I waited for my high counter to trigger and bring her HP below 10,000. Once that happens, I cast Armageddon immediately and Elizabeth goes down. Afterwards I did the last bit of grinding to bring the rest of the boys up to max level. Unlike her sister, Margaret allows a full party, and thankfully there are only a couple of simple rules for this fight. No omnipotent orb, no infinity, and no premature Armageddon. The problem is the fourth and final rule. You have to do at least 5000 damage to her every 10 turns. Margaret has a total of 30,000 HP, even more than the final boss. She also has four distinct phases, with the shifts happening at 25,000, 20,000, and 15,000 respectively. The first phase is by far the hardest. During this phase, she nulls all elemental damage and drains the type of physical damage she uses at the end of her turn. For example, if she uses God's Hand, that means she drains strike attacks. However, that's not what makes doing the necessary amount of damage so difficult. It's her insanely high critical rate. Margaret gets a critical every other turn, sometimes on multiple party members. And most of the time, I'm just stuck trying to pick them back up. After getting wrecked twice by Armageddon, I decided to change my strategy. I gave Anubis the Absorb Strike, Absorb Pierce, and Vorpal Blade skills, and this thankfully made a huge difference. Light is now safe from most of her attacks, and one power-charged Vorpal Blade does over 1300 damage. Also, while Junpei doesn't have Mataru Kaja, I can still achieve the same effect with Fear Sutras. There was a point where Light accidentally healed Margaret due to her draining slash, and she even K out the rest of the party, but I still managed to bring her HP below the threshold, and she cast Poison Mist, starting her second phase. I then used Fuka's Oracle to pick the boys back up, and we continued the fight. During phase 2, she uses a variety of ailment moves, single target physical, elemental, Hama, and Mudo. Thankfully, we still have a few homunculuses left. It also becomes apparent that Margaret isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. She keeps targeting Ken with Hama and Mudo, both of which he nulls thanks to the Ring of Darkness. With the Tome of the Void equipped, Light is immune to all ailments except Poison, and the same power-charged Vorpal Blade strategy from the first phase still works. This changes during her third phase. She now only attacks with multi-target elemental attacks, and is only vulnerable to the opposite of the one she last used. Fire against ice, wind against lightning and vice versa. My strategy here is using Mind Charge followed by Black Viper, while the rest of the boys use elemental gems to keep the pressure on. This ends up working, as her Mind Charge and Power Charge signals the transition to Phase 4. She loses her resistances for the rest of the fight, so we use the attack and magic mirrors we've been hoarding throughout this entire game. The only attack that can get through this is Megiddo Lawn, but it isn't strong enough to KO anyone in the party, and she isn't smart enough to spam it. Instead she uses Akasha Arts, which bounces right back, and does over 2000 damage to her. Yeah, at this point, we pretty much won already. I make absolutely sure that Margaret is below 10,000 HP before bringing out Armageddon one final time, ending the fight, and proving that yes, you can indeed beat Persona 3 Portable as Light Yagami.
Sorry, a bit too soon? Look, Margaret is arguably the toughest of the Velvet Room attendants, and we just mopped the floor with her. I'm pretty sure that somewhere up there Nix's knees are shaking. The only thing left to do now is wait for the 31st, and enter Tartarus one last time to seal the deal. We need to get Strega out of the way first. Jen tries to target our weaknesses, but after realizing we no longer have any, he goes for ailment moves. Once again, Light is safe thanks to the Tome of the Void, and we can easily cure any ailments inflicted on our party members. Jin goes down after just a few attacks, and then blows himself up with his own grenade. I knew this would happen. Instead of wasting time on Takaya, I just shock him with Thunder Call, and then finish him off with a couple of criticals and all-out attacks. Wielding the power of the 13 Arcana, Nyx keeps switching affinities throughout the fight, but at this point it doesn't even matter. Light can literally just spam Mind Charge followed by Black Viper while the rest of the boys provide support. The only move that slightly delays our progress is Moonless Gowl, which repels almighty attacks. But we can just wait until it wears off, and even if she retaliates it's not like she's all that dangerous. I got pretty roughed up by Elizabeth and Margaret, but watching this supposed destroyer of worlds flailing around like a helpless toddler made it all worth it in the end. Without any struggle, we claim our victory. Only for us to realize why Ryoji said that we're going to lose. Remember how the full moon shadows merged into one because we killed them? Turns out that if we kill Nyx, then she just respawns like a Dark Souls protagonist. Ooh. Just as all seems lost, however, we get summoned back into the Velvet Room, where Igor tells us that there is still a way to win. If we can't kill Nyx permanently, then we need to softlock her out of the game. He then helps us unlock our hidden ability, the Great Seal. However, Using this will come at a cost, and afterward Light will only have around one month to live. This is also where we would get encouragement from all the social link characters we maxed out, but since we didn't do any of that, nobody shows up. Total Silence This part also appears in later entries. It's a nice tradition don't get me wrong, there are just a couple of problems with the way it was implemented. That's a story for another day however, for now, it's finally time to save the world. I will. We arrive back at the school gates, where we're greeted by the rest of the squad, and a very teary-eyed Igis. Things are finally back to normal. The days go by quickly, without the shadows, without the dark hour. It seems our mission was truly a success. Although, it seems like everyone forgot about the dark hour, except for Light and Igis. 
That is until graduation day, when suddenly, the memories start flooding back. So everyone rushes to the roof for a big celebration. And this is how the game ends. What are my thoughts on this challenge? For starters, it wasn't really that difficult aside from a few guardians in the early and mid game, as well as the end game. Any of you who played these games knew that Persona 3 will only be a warm up for things to come, though I'm still pretty proud of myself for beating Elizabeth without the divine pillar, as well as finding a solid strategy against Margaret. The real question however is this, do these games live up to the legacy of classic Persona even without the calendar system? In my opinion, Persona 3 passed this test with flying colors. The main story not only holds up on its own, but aside from the endgame grinding, I wasn't really bored in Tartarus at any point either. If you played this game before and want to try a challenge run, I highly recommend giving this one a try. However, due to the ending of this game, I guess I'll have to look for another protagonist before moving on to Persona 4. Until then.